we say it's a privilege for me to be here and uh, tune in to Democracy Now! tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock because I will be on tomorrow morning and I will be discussing something somewhat related to this topic tomorrow morning. And uh, that I'm... Yeah, and that I'm invited b to speak by Democracy Now! You probably can tell that my political orientation is a little bit different from the Heritage Foundation. Um, what I'm going to do very briefly is give a scholastic definition and understanding from my training in terms of what is Sharia and then go into the actual um, background of what I call the anti-Sharia movement here in these United States of America, which started with one anti-Sharia bill in Oklahoma and spread across the country to eventually here in Michigan under the guise of uh, a uh, law or bill to restrict foreign laws, and now is actually um, about to become law, I believe, in the state of South Dakota. First of all, the term Sharia linguistically means a path to a watering hole. Sharia, as defined by Dr. Tariq Ramadan, who's one of the preeminent Islamic scholars in the West, he defines the term Sharia as a path towards faithfulness, meaning that we as Muslims seek to live our lives in the public space as well as in the private space for the pleasure of the Creator and the heavens and the earth, God. And Sharia in and of itself does not mean law or a strict codex of law. So when I hear the term Sharia law, it offends my sensibilities and sensitivities because Sharia in and of itself does not mean law. There is another term in, in, uh, amongst the Islamic scholars called fiqh. Fiqh is jurisprudence. And there are various different schools of thought of jurisprudence within Islam. There are basically the human being, through reading texts and critical thinking, seek to understand the divine will. So in and of itself, there is no one so-called sharia. There is no set codex of laws or regulations that, that, that Muslims 100% agree upon from our ritual worship, which is called ibadat, from our social transactions called mu'amalat, from how we understand justice within a judicial process and those standards for making judgments which includes rewards or some would say punishments. If you're in the United States military and you work for the JAG, then when someone gets punished, it's called a reward. It's the, the irony of, the, uh, of which you get rewarded with uh, 45 days uh, extra duty half your pay taken, or you get rewarded with going to the brig. Now, in terms of this uh, sharia, and this path towards faithfulness, let me make two things very clear. One, that as American Muslims, I have never heard one time of a movement of imams or an Islamic organization here in these United States of America that was seeking to impose any type of Islamic laws or regulations upon people in the broader society, especially those who are not Muslims. I've never heard this one time. I've never heard this one time. The second thing is, is that under the traditional understanding of Islamic law by our scholars, by scholars all throughout the world. There's been books written about this called The Jurisprudence of Muslims Who Are Minorities in Non-Muslim Lands, that Muslims are bound to follow the law of the land in which they live under. So this is part of our jurisprudence, or we can say how we understand going down this path of Sharia. The Quran clearly says, for instance, in the beginning of the fifth chapter, all those of you who believe fulfill all contracts, fulfill all obligations. In another verse of the Quran, it says, and fulfill the covenant, and surely your covenant you are responsible for. You will be questioned by God. What does this mean? This means that when a Muslim, let's say someone immigrates from Senegal, 
Senegal is a Muslim majority country. Someone fills out the papers to get a visa, they fill out an application, they take a citizen test, citizenship test, they pass, they sign the, their agreement and they swear an oath. This is more in Islam than just an agreement or a contract between the individual and the state, but this is also witnessed by the Almighty, so it is a divine contract. It's a, it's a contract that is a sacred contract between the Muslim who comes here and adheres to the laws of the land, that they're supposed to adhere to the laws of the land. A Muslim who was born here in these United States of America is, according to our scholars, what is called, they are born underneath the social contract. And as long as those things that are called wajibat, wajibat means obligatory, if those things can be fulfilled, regarding our worship, then we are to obey the laws of the land without even showing any type of civil disobedience. And I'll give you an example. In the United States of America, Muslims, we can pray five times a day, we have mosques, we can go to Friday sermons, we can fast the month of Ramadan, we can pay our charity. These are things that are underneath our jurisprudence. We can get passports and we can go make pilgrimage. We can get married according to our marital rituals in which we can have one spouse. This is our minimum obligation. And as long as we can do this, then we are to adhere to other laws of the land. Now let me give an example of where we do have the right under Islam to practice civil disobedience. Let's say, God forbid, the First Amendment is thrown out the window. And we Muslims were not able to have a place of worship where we can go for our obligatory Friday prayers. I would be the first one to practice civil disobedience and ignore the law of the land that makes it illegal and I would go to a park and organize the Muslims and pray at the risk of being arrested. I would, I would disobey that. But this is why Dr. Tariq Ramadan and many Islamic scholars say that the United States Bill of Rights and Constitution is a Sharia compliant document. Because the five major objectives of the Sharia, called Muqasid, Muqasid is, is the word in the language of our, uh, of our tradition. Muqasid means that the Sharia, or Muslims in their social, economic, political life, there are five objectives that we seek to live by. These five objectives are that we are to strive towards the protection of religion. The freedom to practice our religion. The freedom of, uh, 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 to protect life. The protection of al-aql or intellect. To be able to think freely and have intellectual property. The protection of al-mal, property rights, and, and nasl, which means posterity or inheritance. These are the five objectives of, loosely, of sharia, the objectives though there can be different schools of thought in which their implementation. Now, to give you an example historically of how Muslims have understood this, <clears throat> as, because part of the fear, the fear mongering going on about Sharia is that we Muslims have, uh, even though we make up less than 2% of the population, that we Muslims somehow want to impose Islam on people who aren't Muslims. So at the end of the day, I don't think that the broader American public is really worried about whether we are trying to, uh, uh, Muslims are trying to, to, to practice polygamy or that uh, we don't want to deal with interest or that uh, uh, we don't want to uh, be involved in alcohol and gambling. That's not the real issue. The real issue is there are people who are scared that we Muslims are trying to impose our will and impose Islam upon the broader society against its will. If you look back historically, and I can give you three historical examples before I move on to the, to the, to the state of affairs regarding um, the anti-Sharia movement here in these United States of America. When the Muslims governed the Iberian Peninsula, modern day Portugal and Spain, Muslims governed this area, and when it came to issues of family law, and when it came to commercial law, 
Muslims never did at that time impose the Islamic law upon what are called Ahlul Kitab, the people of the book. So it was established in what Jewish scholars call their golden age, that when Jews had issues regarding to their family law issues or commercial law dealing with them, they had their own judges or their rabbis to judge according to the Torah and the Talmud. They were not judged by the Quran or the traditions of Prophet Muhammad. Likewise, Christians had their own courts. In terms of the Mughal Empire, Muslims ruled or governed a majority area of the Indian subcontinent during this time under what's called the Hanafi school of law. And during the Mughal Empire, people who were not Muslims, predominantly Hindus, were not uh, forced in a systematic way to adopt Islamic law. Similarly, in West Africa, under the Sokoto Empire and the Songhai Empire, where Muslims were the minority and governed that area of West Africa, there is no historical proof that Muslims uh, force people who are not Muslims to adhere to the Islamic standards in terms of marriage, divorce, financial transactions, staying away from usury, etc. This is uh, one issue. The other issue in terms, now let me go to the anti-Sharia uh, uh, movement and then I will sit down. I will not take my entire 20 minutes because I would like to um, to hear the uh, rebuttal comments and then allow you all to add, ask questions. The anti-Sharia movement, which really there is no threat of Muslims taking over the American legal system to begin with, the anti-Sharia movement started off by a very well-funded movement and the architect of this movement, according to the Anti-Defamation League, and our, our uh, research as well, is a white supremacist in New York by the name of David Yoroshalmi. And you can go to the Anti-Defamation League's website as well as the Southern Poverty Law Center and look up this man, David Yoroshalmi, and there's a nice piece, July 13th, 2012. David Yoroshalmi, a driving force behind the anti-Sharia efforts in the United States of America. David Yoroshalmi, who has worked along with, a, uh, with some other uh, neoconservative think tanks, began to propose anti-Sharia legislation across the United States of America, starting with the state of Oklahoma, Oklahoma being the first of these states saying that, that the courts did not have to recognize Sharia or Islamic law. What was the primary defense? Because it was my organization, the Council of American Islamic Relations, our executive director actually, who was the plaintiff in this case, and we were the ones who argued this case in court, is that this country cannot single out one religion or over another, nor prefer any religion over the other. So the issue was by singling out Sharia, or saying Islamic law, that it basically was singling out or, or saying that, okay, Islamic law specifically by name can't be factored in in American courts. This was the primary reason why this, uh, uh, this was our primary defense regarding this case, and we were successful in the uh, initial ruling and then it went to a federal um, uh, appeals court and then we were successful again. This has spread to other states but they changed the language because they saw that what happened in Oklahoma and how we uh, sued regarding Oklahoma so then the language was broadened to the restriction of foreign laws, acts or bills that was taken throughout the United States of America. Now you say what is the danger of this because no Muslims in America or calling for any type of uh, punishment, such as if someone gets caught drinking some alcohol, they get lashed uh, 40 times with a whip, like in Saudi Arabia or Iran. No American Muslims are calling for this. And unfortunately, to uh, my chagrin, in many major cities in America, such as in Chicago or New York, the majority of liquor stores are actually owned by Muslims. <laughs> They're owned by Arab American Muslims who own the majority of liquor stores, primarily Palestinians own the majority of liquor stores in the United States of America, okay? Um, 
and they're involved in other types of businesses as well. But my, my, my point that I'm getting at uh, in terms of this is that this whole movement, this whole anti-Sharia movement in which there is no, there is no real threat of, of these types of harsh punishments taking, taking place in the United States of America, is that there are certain people, politicians in one particular political party, that have instituted these, policy, these bills in every single state basically to score cheap political points. You'll see that almost every sponsor of anti-Sharia legislation in America and in America in states has also introduced Arizona-style immigration legislation. Like, for instance, in Michigan, State Rep. Dave Edgema, the same one who put forth the so-called no birthright citizenship type legislation here in Michigan, the same person who put forth the Arizona-style immigration legislation here in Michigan is the same one who put forth the so-called anti-Sharia legislation. These are types of issues that are being introduced more so as a cultural war that don't have any real uh, semblance or bearance on our judicial system. Now, what is the detriment for us as Muslims and us as Americans in general? And I'll give an example of this bill would have passed what could have happened. Well, let me use New York for a sample before I go here. Let's say an anti-religious laws act were passed in New York City, uh, or anti-foreign uh, laws act, and it's used in this very loose legis uh, in this very loose language that could also include religious laws. Well, the fiqh or the jurisprudence of Islam, you will see in regards to ritual worship and financial transactions and many things, is similar to Judaic law. So, for instance, in the city of New York. Taxpayer dollars pay for kosher meals because there's a large population of Jewish Americans who are students in New York City. If such legislation were to pass, someone could argue that Judaic law in and of itself constitutes some type of foreign system of law. Therefore, taxpayer dollars should not be used to pay for kosher meals. Likewise, this argument was used here. Dearborn Public Schools Dearborn is 40% Arab American, but the school system is about 80% Arab American. And because of this need, halal meats are used in Dearborn public schools. So some people were saying, well, look, we have this creeping sharia in Dearborn because taxpayer dollars are paying for some halal hot dogs. You know, some, some, some halal hot dogs. Pamela Geller talked about the sharia scare because uh, Walmart was selling halal uh, butterball turkeys for, uh, for Thanksgiving so if people eat the halal turkey maybe they might become Muslim through osmosis. <laughs> so the argument was made that this is the creeping sharia in Dearborn public schools so therefore if this type of bill would have been passed then theoretically speaking there could then be a ban of taxpayer dollars being used just to accommodate the dietary needs of the majority of students in the city of Dearborn, Michigan. Now I'd like to mention a couple of things because I, uh, before I forget, because we are entitled to our own opinions, but we are not entitled to our own facts. Uh, in regards to the Buffalo case in which that man, Muzamul Hassan, who I actually personally know, who beheaded his wife in Bridges TV uh, studio, which is very unfortunate, he uh, entered a plea of not guilty during that case and he never invoked anything having to do with Islam or Islamic law during that case. That's number one. And you can look, up, you can look it up online yourself uh, if you don't believe it. Uh, the other uh, situation that I would like to bring to mind is in terms of that gentleman who, uh, who uh, assaulted that uh, Muhammad Zambi recently. He's been on CNN. That man had the right to make fun of Prophet Muhammad. He had that right. And I defend his First Amendment right to make fun of Prophet Muhammad. Prophet Muhammad himself allowed people to make fun of him and he didn't beat them down or kill him. There are many stories in our Islamic tradition of he'd be praying and people poured entrails on him. There's a, there's a, people would come and dump trash in his yard that he prayed and sometimes people put their feet put their feet on his neck. 
He was called a liar. He was called a fraud. He was called a sorcerer. He was called Mu'allim Majnun. He was called the, 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 the insane teacher. He was insulted in his face, and he never took any type of retribution. So part of our understanding of the Islamic practice, part of our understanding of the Islamic practice and our adab, our manners and our character, our ethics, comes from his personal example. That judge who made those comments, uh, who's a Lutheran, by the way, he's not a Muslim, I think that was actually some bonehead comments that uh, that, that judge uh, that judge made because offending someone's uh, sensibilities or sensitivities uh, is uh, that has no bearing in regards to a case. However, that man who uh, assaulted and harassed that man, uh, to my knowledge, uh, of reading about that case, I don't think he invoked the Quran or any type of Islamic law either in terms of his emotional uh, outburst. So I wanted to make uh, that clear. Uh, those two things clear for the record because again as I said we can be against Islamic law we can have our opinions regarding that but we, can, we have a right to our opinions but we do not have a right to our own facts so with that uh, thank you <laughs>